or um, particular questions that you may have about news and management all that stuff. Nick? One screaming thing that I kind of uh, noticed through the readings was in that it actually brought up a pretty good a, a pretty, pretty good point is um, zoos are especially today they're um, they strive to be this model for animal welfare and um, just quality of life. However, mm-hmm. in the shadow of every particularly every carnivore are thousands of feeder animals that are fed to them every day and um i i'll I'll be the first to admit i'm like i don't know much about where those feeder animals come from and what their uh quality of life prior to um slaughter is yeah, so let's have that conversation because this is actually a big conversation, and I was, I was in a meeting about this uh, for Fila Tag. Not was it Omaha or was it Pittsburgh? It might have been Pittsburgh. It was a Pittsburgh meeting. Uh, so there was more conversation about like the ethically sourcing of Peter foods. Well, not even just that. What you sourcing was. was. There, that's part of it, but we can even go even further into that because not only can we address the ethical aspects of ensuring because again we're trying to address that all animals have a high standard of of life that they were addressing welfare that we're addressing the five domains um so feeder animals and sourcing those feeder animals have to be part of that conversation but the other part of that comes from the environmental impacts of raising feeder animals because of the fact that it has a tremendous amount of impact on the local landscape so if we look at, like, let's look at large carnivores in particular, okay? So if we look at our, our polar bears, our, you know, our large felids, our large canids, they eat a special carnivore diet that is made specifically for zoo carnivores, right? There are two companies in the, in the United States that, that supply this diet and that manufacture this diet. A majority of the diet is one type of... Well, no, Missouri doesn't touch carnivore like that. The meat, they don't touch. No, they the use the only pellet. The great Agadon hunter is from the tales. So, if, if we take a look at uh, the, the ground meat products that we feed out uh, to our carnivores, what is the primary protein base? Like, what is the first meat? Horse. Horse. Yeah, horse. Horse. So, one of the, the biggest. So, why not cow? Well, so cows, there's a couple of issues with cows. Cows are raised for human consumption. And with with human consumption, if you if you ever have a cow that is, that if you ever take a look at the meat that comes out of a cow, you're gonna notice that it has something that's called marbling, right? That marbling is you're gonna see that white, kind of almost like spider web running through the meat. Have you guys noticed that before? If you ever look at a hunk of meat, you'll see yeah, that fat marbling. Yeah. They shouldn't have that. That is actually put into place by humans to make them taste better, right? So we fatten our animals up and we actually give them a higher fat content uh, because of the fact it makes the meat taste better, right? So that marbling is for human consumption. The marbling and the result of that actually causes the meat to be unhealthy for captive carnivores. If you were to feed cow to like as like the standard cattle that's raised for that, um, to for carnivore consumption, um, it actually it presents a lot of issues potentially with health with them, primarily the fat content and the low protein content. Bovids in general have a hard time, or they, they pack on on fat very quickly. The issue that we would have to, that that presents itself when you raise cattle, if you were to even just have specialized herds devoted for this purpose to feed large carnivores in captivity, you would have to range feed them, and you would actually the this current approach to feeding cattle would not work, right? Because they're they're feedlotted. The the current system for feeding cows is designed to enhance that fat content, right? We do that on purpose. You have to change up their whole diet. 
well, you have to change the whole diet and you have to change the whole system in which they're raised. So you can't feedlot them anymore. You actually have to, and part of the reason why feedlots are effective is not only can you raise a large amount of animals in a confined space and you can get them there, it restricts movement. And so when you're restricting a lot of movement, that automatically prevents that from being broken down, right? Because they're putting on that, that they're not they're not exercising the way they should. So in order to have uh, that standard, in order to be able to raise cattle for consumption of carnivores, they would have to be range fed and they would not have to be, they could not have a supplemental diet beyond hay. Essentially, they would have to have a close to a natural diet as possible. That's almost impossible to do with cattle and to do it effectively. That's why range fed beef is so expensive because it costs so much money for the farmer to do it and they can't turn a profit on cows that way, right? Cows are not profitable on that family. With horses, horses are easy to breed. They're they're athletic by nature. They don't have, they don't retain fat as well as they do. They're a leaner protein. Um, so the, the whole method behind that is actually easier for horses and because horses are more social by nature than what cows are kind of semi-solitary they'll hurt us. dealing with a large amount of waste we're dealing with a large amount of increased um, greenhouse gases because these animals produce a lot of methane and they produce a lot of other um, carbon-based uh, gases that actually contribute to um, uh, uh, greenhouse or global climate change quicker and more so than public transportation or even cars do. Um, and so there's a lot of environmental degradation that goes with that waste management in the big one. Then you look at how the food is grown for those animals. The majority of the of the um, corn production that we see in the United States is not grown to feed humans. 70% of that is actually grown to feed livestock, right? So we have the production of the food that these animals have to eat, and that's very taxing on the land, and it's actually very, um, very destructive in many cases. We see a lot of river damage. We see a lot of different issues with that. Here in the state of Florida, our red algae blooms are exaggerated by the production of, of farming, right? So our farming practices are what exaggerates those red tide blooms and the um, choking of the river. That stems from agriculture. Uh, so it, agriculture in general is very toxic, right? It's very difficult. So we have a couple of issues when we look at carnivores that we're dealing with in that moment. So we have to look at the quality of life for these animals that are their prey. And then we also have to look at the euthanasia component of it too, right? We cannot euthanize these animals utilizing any type of chemical because if that chemical, with the, like with pentobarbital or uh, phenobarbital, the two common euthanasia solutions, as soon as those are injected into the animal, they go through the entire body system. If you were to feed that animal to another animal, that animal could potentially die from it, right? Because wow. that stays in the meat. So they once they bolt, do they bolt gun them? They yeah, so what happens they bolt gun them and then they slit their throat, right? And okay. so you look at the, the process of euthanizing these animals, it's very traumatic for them. Um, but it has to, you can't do it in a way that, that damages the, their quality of meat because then they're no good anymore. Right, then if they're, they're oh, going with the purpose. Yeah. So, has anybody ever looked at the level of cortisol uh, output during predation based on and then compared to being put down by like a bolt gun? So, here, here's the problem with that you have to intervene at the right moment. And if you have an animal actively being preyed upon, you have to get that carcass away from the predator. And that's not an easy task. That's actually a very life task for you. Right, so that that, that poses a, a very large question here, saying, can we really say that being put down by the bolt gun is any more traumatic than being hunted and yeah. killed alive and then being eaten alive? You, you really can't, but you can't say that it's as, as humane as the, the chemical component, though. The yeah, chemical component we know is more humane. So that's where anything above beyond that is actually considered to be not necessarily humanely done, right? Because the animal has to suffer through a certain point to be able to get through that. When they, okay, so there's a couple of other things that we look at, too. We also, beyond horses, we look at the production of eggs, mice, rats, crickets, um, a myriad of insects, um, baby chicks, right? So we feed out quail chicks all the time to different animals. We feed out quail, we feed out rabbits, we feed out guinea pigs. 
all of these animals fall into that, that, that process. And so the, the small animals in particular are, you know, bred in these facilities that mass produce these animals by the thousands on a daily basis, right? So it's a, it's almost kind of like a battery system for, for small mammals, right? Um, and so there's a concern with that as well. Um, and then if you extend that beyond another issue and you start looking at your fish eating animals, right? And we know our emotions are shot. I was going to ask about that. We know that farming of fish is not great on the, the environment. It's even worse. And so now you have to balance the environmental and ethical aspects that you have fish eating animals in captivity and you have to farm or get a hold of that, that prey item on a consistent and regular basis without sacrificing uh, the animal's quality of life or the, the type of nutrition that they need. So it's very difficult. And this is a, a challenge that zoos face and we're constantly having conversations about this, about how do we address these issues and how do we, you know, we can't turn a blind eye to it and we have to continue to increase those standards but we can't increase the standards to the point where it puts us out of the ability to feed our animals because it has to expensive, right? Um, so there's a lot of issues and there's a lot of gray area and there's a lot of things that people are very critical about with this approach. One of the other things, so when I was in, at the Pittsburgh meeting for Philotech, one of the conversations that we were very open and frank about was the fact that we know that these animals you know, it, it's not ideal to be feeding horses. We don't, we don't particularly like that. That's something we can't publicly say that we feed about horses either, because the public would lose their mind over it, right? So they're now kind, of, and we also know that that ground product, that ground component, is not great, right? So both of those brands are okay. They're acceptable. We, we know that they work, but when you pull ground beef that comes from one of them, and I can say what grade it is, but if you pull um, beef out of one of those, or the, or not beef, um, the, the ground meat out of that um, container, it suds up like it's soapy. That's not a good thing, right? That that makes you wor like not worry about There's also times where you have to strain the, like the product and the, the tubing in order to get the charcoal out of it, right? Because it's packed charcoal. So you have to, there's a lot of things you have to do to clean the meat in order to make it ready to be eaten by your animals. That makes you nervous, right? That, that as an individual caring for the animals, you have to think about those things and that, that pops in your head on a regular basis. So we also know these animals should be carcass feeding because they need access to the whole parts of the animal, right? Not just the uh, kind of given areas, but they also need bones, they need the access, access to the intestines and all these other things. So. One of the things that zoos are quietly exploring, and this is not a public thing by any means, but we have facilities that belong to C2S2. Do you guys, did we ever, did you ever learn about C2S2 at all? No. No. So C2S2 is a, is a grouping of zoos that belong um, in a pact and a partnership together, and it stands for the, uh, the Centers for Conservation and Sustainability, I think is what it is. Here, let me, let me double check that. Um, because I can even tell you who the members are. Um, is this like, is this like, is this animals? Well, yeah, so, so C2S2 is the Conservation Centers for Species Survival. Um, and what they focus on are facilities that have the room to be able to have multi-acre exhibits, um, to house actual herds of animals and to breed animals in a setting away from the public, right? So we have a couple of them that belong to that. Um, so the African Lion Safari, um, Fossil Rim, uh, Fossil Rim is actually one of the founding members, North Carolina, Omaha, um, Smithsonian, The Wilds, Animal Kingdom, um, Fort Worth, uh, The Wildlife Ranch, Oklahoma City, Taronga, White Oak, and then Zoo Tampa. They are part of the, the system. They're part of C2S2. Um, and San Diego, is, and San Diego Safari Park is part of that too. Um, so C2, and it's a very small group of individuals, right? It's not a, a very large number of zoos. Um, and the, and Audubon is part of this now too. They just actually signed online a couple, um, months ago when their new facility came on. Um, but they, C2S2 meets certain requirements in order to be part of this affiliated group in which that you have to have, um, like hundreds of acres devoted to 
in land anim- or land management in order to support large animal groupings, right? So at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, that is a 4,000 acre facility. And we were, I remember one of the cool things I ever saw was a herd of scimitar horned orange. You know, they're extinct in the wild and they've got 60 of them all together. And they are on this huge 100 acre pasture. Isn't that, like, um, in, isn't that in, uh, what's it called? Uh, what? This hub was a maker design. She knows the system. The the horned works isn't that in Ohio? No. Um, or is that so different collection? Well, you're probably thinking of the one that's called the wilds. The wilds can also do the same thing, but but there's multiples of these facilities that do that. So one of the conversations... What? It's the one that's in the other secrets of the zoo. It's the one that's in the other secrets of the zoo. I will set the portal coordinates. The wilds. Okay, yeah. Um, so one of the things that C2S2 is working on and that we had a conversation with as, you know, with, as a field attack steering committee with the, the directors of these facilities was that they have acreage that's not being used. They have acreage that's left open. So why are we not taking some of our common animals, such as the Thompson gazelles, the springbok, the zebra, um, and then a couple of other small antelope, and why are we not mass breeding them ourselves and then carcass feeding these animals out to our carnivores? Um, and no one's opposed to it. And that's the interesting thing. Zoos are very interested in this idea. Um, because it's better for the animals in the long run, and now we're able to create a surplus kind of thing of common antelope that we really need, right? So there's there's a lot of conversation happening kind of in the shadows about this idea of carcass feeding, and the Smithsonian is all about this. Like, this is where they want to go. This is where their nutritionist firmly believes they need to be going, and they're truly leading the way and trying to pilot this. Um, and so there, there's a lot of work being done out there on how do we create these sustainable herds of animals that these predators would normally eat and then give access to you know these carcasses um, in order to feed these carnivores, right? And there's some logistics that come in with that for sure, of especially like how are you shipping antelope across the country and all these other things and how are you feed carcass feeding with guests and all this other stuff. So there's a lot of conversations that have to happen in order to figure it out but it's something that zoos want to do. And it's something that they want to take advantage of because we have these facilities. The other conversation that's also being explored is that in the early 2000s, um, EZA bought a bunch of land in Florida outside of Mayaka, um, and they actually built the EZA Elephant Center. And the whole idea was that as they were increasing the standards, they knew zoos were not going to be able to handle keeping these elephants. And so this was supposed to be this huge you know, thousand acre facility um, designed to manage elephants that zoos would send them to essentially either retire or to create new herds before they could go off to another zoo. Um, Or in the instance that there were zoos at the time that wanted to bring in and import additional elephants from Africa and Asia, that that would be the place that they would go um, in order to quarantine, be ready, and then they would ship them to the zoo that wanted that herd. So they had this facility, um, and it became kind of obsolete very quickly because zoos moved faster than EZA did, um, and they were shipping animals around a lot faster than EZA was anticipating. But EZA has this land of where they're trying to figure out what to do with, whether they're going to sell it or get rid of it, turn it into a conservation easement, whatever that's going to be. And there's been conversation about why don't we turn that into a facility designed to mass produce carnivore diets um, and raise these animals that could potentially be used for carnivore diets. Um, and I, I don't know, I might, if I had a hunch, I would say they probably going to offload that land and they're not going to keep it. Um, but there's some conversation that's happening around that. I, I mean, they could establish the, the, hold on, they could establish the guidelines that way if they were the ones to manage that for the first time ever. Well, and here's the problem that comes with it though, right? There was a zoo who humanely euthanized an old or a, a surplus animal, and this was in Europe, and it happens to Europe a little bit. Uh, they sur- they euthanized surplus animals, the ones that they didn't need, and they knew that couldn't place or that it couldn't go to another zoo. They euthanized them and then fed them to the other animals, right? And, and people lost their minds over it, right? Like people lost their minds. So one of the things that I have to you have to figure out before you can even begin that process or even begin um, going down that road 
book is you have to understand if people are even capable of handling seeing carcass feeding or supporting a zoo raising a herd of antelope for the sole purpose of literally slaughtering to feed another animal right there's a lot of um public perception issues that have to be threaded out and dealt with um in order for that to even become a policy or even move even further um because if you go down that road and you start feeding you know purposely bred animals for that reason people could lose their mind over it um you know people don't handle carcass feeding well you know and, and that was something that we that you learn very quickly as a carnivore keeper you like you think oh we can push the boundaries a little bit it's fine um one of my favorite exhibits that we had in Omaha with me um in our old zebra pasture before they bulldozed it for the new one. In our old zebra pasture, um, one of our volunteers actually like created a synthetic antelope skeleton. Like they actually molded and casted a, an antelope skeleton. It was really super cool. Uh, and we had vultures that we were looking to place, right? Like we needed a, an exhibit for them to go into. So the decision was that we were going to put them in with the zebras, um, but we needed kind of a space for them and, and a thing to keep them occupied. So we. It, like the the team actually built um, kind of this like little bit of an elevated mound with like rocks and all this other stuff, and then this kind of this like you know a little bit of like an island, almost a big parking lot island, and then there was a um, synthetic um, uh, antelope skeleton put out in that yard, kind of buried down, so it looked like it had been there for a while. And then what they would do is the keepers would go in and actually like put the meat or wrap it around the like the ribs and would hide it and do all this other stuff. So it looked like the vultures were pulling apart um, a, a skeleton, right? Super cool, right? Super yeah, cool. Yeah, great for the birds. Um, it didn't bother the zebras one bit. They're like, oh, whatever. Um, and like, it was great from a messaging standpoint because you could talk about the importance of vultures and how this whole thing worked. We had to take it out within a year because our whole goal is that we were doing things in the exhibits and getting the exhibits ready and dealing with carnivore related issues and potentially dangerous animal issues that's when we worked venomous right we didn't work venomous when people were on the ground uh so we worked venomous during that morning time frame when um people weren't around that's when we serviced and really did a lot of like the cleaning up after the carnivores on that night um and, and so we serviced all of our exhibits before we opened <laughs> And then we closed early to be able to give the animals additional things that, that we wouldn't necessarily do during the day, right? So it actually, the, the zoo hours are designed to really accommodate the keeper staff and to make sure the keepers have the ability to do the job that they have to do. Um, yeah, I mentioned that. Um, so with, so going back to the farming of like natural prey, is that any more sustainable in terms of like you talking about mass producing right is that any more sustainable than what we're doing currently the whole idea is like if we're doing environmentally damaging things already why not do it in a way that's better like why not do or create a product that's better for the animals in the long run that's true is there a way do you think there would be i mean we know that like you know cows aren't exactly the most healthy animals in terms of, like, what we've done to them. But, like, you know, we do, you know, we do have these huge herds naturally in the wild of, you know, these other animals that are not, are, are far less, you know, modified for human consumption. Would that, like, would they still have that same detrimental impact? What animals are you talking about? Because I'm not aware of any animals that, that meet that category. I mean, like, would they, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying is like, because of like what humans have done to cows, do th does that make them more, de like, detrimental in terms of like, their output than other, uh, like potential prey items that we other prey items and whatever. Um, is their body size? They're they're massive animals. Any large mammal has the same kind of impact, right? The same environmental impact. The difference that exists with your wild animals, though, is that in a healthy ecosystem, all of that is cycled through, and there's checks and balances that exist through all the different nutrient cycling systems that make that a wash and that don't impact the land, right? That doesn't exist with farming. That system is gone with agriculture, right? There's no human creation. Yeah. Correct. 
It's, the, it's not the animal that's the problem. It's the system that's mass producing the animals that's the problem. Gotcha. Do you think we could? Do you think that, like, in a situation, in a situation like what the AVA has, do you think it would be possible to create something that would recreate that natural environment, like adding plant, adding plants that can say no? Nope. Okay. No, because you're still recreating the habitat and creating a man-made situation.